Good morning and welcome here to St. Mary's on this the ninth Sunday after Trinity. Apologies to those on live stream who missed the broadcast last week. Uh, I think is it uh, circumstances beyond our control is what we have to say. Basically, the box of tricks over there didn't work, but I hope that you're back with us this week and we'll try and make up for lost time with you. Uh, congratulations this morning to St. George's in Newtown, who are celebrating 50 years of existence today, and they have Bishop uh, John Sentamu as their guest preacher there this morning, so I'm sure they will have a very rhythmic uh, service, if nothing else, but we do extend to them our good wishes. The notices are, as you have them on the service sheet, it's summertime, do please take notice at, at the bottom of the service sheet of those who are doing things next week. As you prepare for worship, think about what the church is for. Why are you here? What difference does it make to you to be here? How should you be different when you leave here? And always the question that's in the back of my mind. I think I know physically what the church will look like in a hundred years' time because nobody's going to do much to it between now and then. But what's it going to look like spiritually in a hundred years' time? So as we prepare for worship, talk to God. Allow God to talk to you and we will see uh, what inspiration we can have. And so we need that prayer as we begin. Guide me, O thou great Redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church, open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if we had only died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard you complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. from the epistle to the Ephesians. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, as he said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. descended into the lower part of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascends far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some 
would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of, of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the highest into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our King and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, two bits of good news uh, for today. Uh, first, it's good to see Eureka back. Uh, she's uh, not quite fully functional because she's turned up plastered. Uh, not a thing to do in church, really. Uh, but her plaster is coming off this week, and she promises not to assault any pavements in the future. So wonderful to have you back in situ and in harness again. And the other thing is that uh, thank you for bearing with us with the sound. Uh, we have just this morning uh, agreed that we will uh, be getting a whole new uh, set of microphones, and hopefully uh, that will help things out. But bear with us. If only Jesus could be persuaded to do miracles to order. What a difference that would make to the reputation of the church, the mission of the church, our reputation as Christians saying that we believe in God. But even if that were remotely possible, if we could feed 5,000 people in Hansworth Park from a bag of crisps and a tin of sardines, that we could become proficient, as proficient as turning water into wine as we are as turning wine into water, if the hem of my cassock could be touched so much so that the accident and emergency unit at City Road was to close, it wouldn't make a lasting indent in belief, confirmations, or even attendance at church. Because performance Christianity gathers spectators rather than disciples. In the verses before we join John's Gospel, Jesus has just fed 5,000 people and then they wouldn't let him escape. Do another trick for us, Jesus. Do something else. Impress us. And they don't want an explanation of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty, saying it's a metaphor for spiritual hunger and spiritual thirst always being satisfied. They stick with their appeal. Did you hear it in the gospel? What sign are you going to give us then? What sign are you going to give us so that we, we may see it and believe? And what they're saying, and what Christians have been guilty of saying for so long is, Make it about me, Jesus, not you. Make it about me. I need to see. I need to benefit. I need to be convinced. Who cares that you're the Son of God? Who cares that you can walk on water? Who cares that you can feed 5,000 people with a crust? It's about me, Jesus. Impress me. And most of us are guilty of that at some point or other. And that has been what I think has been happening in the church. The Church of England has become obsessed with itself, with statistics and performance religion, so that what does it matter that we meet in a place that has been hallowed by prayer for centuries? Meet in your own living rooms. What does it matter that there is a tradition of apostles and prophets and priests? Now, nah, do it yourself. Have it a do it yourself religion, and all will be well. People will throng if you make it about them. And the Church of England has got it wrong at this moment in time because they forget it is a church to serve Christ, not themselves. 
And what matter is it that if statistics don't match up, if faithfully, through parish churches, which are the most under-resourced part of the Church of England, what does it matter if the statistics don't add up, if people are served and prayed for and baptized and married and buried? All pointing to Christ and not to futile ideas that come from archbishops and councils and synods. The Church of England has taken a wrong turn. And, yes, I'm aware that anyone can hear what I'm saying through the joys of live streaming. And I will say it again and again and again. Performance religion is a sin because it detracts from Christ and draws attention to the performers. And one of the... Uh, you, you'll get it. I'm quite uh, definite in my views that the Church of England really needs to reinvest in parish churches, in people on the ground, not fancy ideas. Now the Diocese of Birmingham, what's its catchphrase? Come on, you should know it. We're growing younger. Bishop, Bishop, please, don't make us peddle something that's a medical impossibility. Has anyone here grown younger this week? <laughs> Has anyone <laughs> managed the opposite? <laughs> yep. Let's have something realistic where Christ meets with people where they are through the ministry of the parish church. And one of the less attractive traits in the people of faith, alongside the self-centeredness that wants it to be about them, is that they also have a short memory. It shows a lack of maturity, and that was the case among the Hebrews who had forgotten the miracles associated with the escape from Egypt, the Passover, the passing through the Red Sea, all those things. They were forgotten as the people complained, if only, <coughs> if only we had died in the land of Egypt, where well, there were flesh pots for us. Hey, have you seen it? It's all about me again. Make me better. How easily we fall into the same trap of forgetting what God has done for us in calling us to faith, in calling us to be a church together in a particular place, of forgiving us and allowing that to be eclipsed by temporary difficulties along the way. Maturity, according to Paul, arrives when our priority is to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And instead of complaining about a life of humility and patience and love and maintaining unity, we need to be honest that we're not spectators, but we are disciples who are called to do what God tells us. We belong in one body, and this celebrates that life in God where there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And recognizing this turns us around from what we can get to focus on what we can give in serving this one Lord, one faith, one baptism, using the gifts God has given us we devote ourselves to the work of ministry and to building up the body of Christ. Now, forgive me. I don't often do this, but I'm going to quote at length from the previous Bishop of London, the Right Honourable and the Right Reverend Dr. Richard Chartres. Great man, great man. And he has been reflecting on the issues facing the church today. You ready? I'm only going to read this once, 
So if you want it, it'll be on the website. <laughs> or if you can bear it, you can watch it again. There is a malaise which even afflicts some priests who seem to have no idea of who or what they are. No clear idea of what they are trying to do or why they are trying to do it. This has tempted some to describe acts, aspects of our church tradition, including priestly ordination, as key limiting factors as they search to connect with young people. It is true that we have been overtaken by a very rapid social change in which we can expect the Holy Spirit to reshape the church as an era in which perhaps we felt too much at home passes away, it is right to look expectantly for the living forms that Jesus and his church will take in the Christian centuries to come. But alongside this proper expectancy, there is an insidious temptation to believe that we can abbreviate the birth pangs of the new age by drastic surgery when we don't, really don't, have the spiritual insight to understand what we are doing. It seems to me that we are in particular danger of reducing the Christ-given sacramental character of the church to a thin and insubstantial sociological concept. The church worthy of the name is brought into being by baptism and nourished by the Eucharist. It grows into the place where we can be incorporated as very members of the body of Christ. The reality of the church is constituted not by the prescriptions of some committee, but by the celebration of the transformative Eucharist by an ordained priest in the presence of the community of the faithful. The priest is the representative of the diocesan bishop, and together they are not in the net which maintains the unity of the church in faithfulness to the teaching of the apostles. This is how it has been over many centuries and in different cultures. The Eucharist builds the church and is not something the church puts on to cater for our religious needs and tastes. No doubt the impatience with inherited forms reflects a disappointment with so much church life that many people currently experience. It has always been so. The church should be a restorative cell capable of neutralizing the cancers that are gnawing at our society. But as we know, the reality is so often depressingly anemic. But demolition is not the answer. Andrew Brown, one of the shrewdest commentators on the religious scene in our day, observes that one of the symptoms of extreme hypothermia is the urge to remove all one's clothes, even in a blizzard. Panic is a faithless and fruitless response to the challenge we face. This isn't a performance. This isn't staged. As we break bread, Christ meets with his people. You are his people. We are his church. And in this parish, we represent Christ. Our task isn't futile. Our presence isn't hopeless. Our life is vibrant because Christ made it so. And anything that detracts from that 
any idea that takes the focus away from the church as Christ's living body is wrong. Amen. We stand. Let us declare our faith in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So let us pray for the church and for the world and let us thank God for his goodness. that we may be sensitive and caring in our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all power and might, comfort all who have run out of power, all who lack energy or whose abilities are failing. We pray for those who are weak through hunger and neglect, for all who have become ill, and for all who care for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are the God who heals and restores. We give thanks for all who have entered into the newness of life in your kingdom, praying today for Irene Connell, John Robertson, Susie McGovern, and from our Book of Remembrance, Kerry Ann Tuston. We pray for loved ones who serve you now in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, our God, you give us the true bread that comes down from heaven, even your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that as we receive him into our lives, we may be filled with the fullness of his love and abide in him as he abides in us. Through the same Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. We stand. Let love be genuine. Never pay back evil for evil. As far as it lies with you, live at peace with everyone. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made, will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Receive us, O God, as we prepare your table, and by your transforming power, let us be found as one body, 
and one spirit in Christ, who is alive forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Savior. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he to he opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. He fulfilled your will and won for you a hope. So we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Thoughts of all holy. Grant by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. And so Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming in glory. We celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray with confidence, as our Saviour has taught us. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be on earth as it is in heaven.
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word. Thank you. 
Holy Father, who gathered us here around the table of your Son to share this meal with the whole household of God, in that new world where you reveal the fullness of your peace, gather people of every race and language to share in the eternal banquet of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. You are disciples, not spectators. You are disciples, not spectators. What are you? And again, what are you? And don't be hoodwinked by daft ideas with people in pointy hats, fancy title jobs. We are the church of Christ. We are disciples, not spectators. Lord be with you. May God, who in Christ gives us a spring of water, welling up to eternal life, perfect in you the image of his glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen.